In this video, I'll be discussing phase changes of pure substances and their relationship to intermolecular forces. If you haven't yet watched the video on intermolecular forces, I recommend pausing and going back and rewatching that before continuing. Our objectives are to draw molecular level pictures for a given heating or cooling process, as well as to calculate the heat required um, to vaporize or melt a given amount of material. This picture here is showing the same substance, water, in three different states. You'll notice that in the solid and liquid state, the water molecules are much closer together on average than in the, gases, the gaseous phase. Because of this, we refer to solids and liquids as condensed phases, whereas in the gas, the molecules or atoms involved are much farther apart on average. This will be important in a little bit. Now remembering back to a previous module, is water the process of boiling water con uh, considered to be a chemical or physical change? You'll recall that this is a physical change because the identity of the water molecules doesn't change upon boiling. Now the, in the boiling process, we can describe the potential energy as a function of the distance between the particles on average. The particles in the liquid are closer together on average and have a lower potential energy. We now know that this is because, or that this lower potential energy is attributed to the intermolecular forces within the sample of water, including dispersion, dipole-dipole, uh, and hydrogen bonding. Now, in order to go from the liquid to the gas phase, it's, rel it's, it's important to disrupt these intermolecular forces, which means that the distance between molecules will be larger, or will be larger on average. The potential energy that must be put in is put in to overcome these intermolecular forces and therefore separate the water molecules, going from a less thermodynamic or a more thermodynamically favorable state in the liquid to a less or to a to a state of higher energy in the gas. We can describe this process going from liquid to gas using what's called a heating curve. Now the y-axis the y -axis is showing the temperature, and the x-axis is showing the amount of heat added. Initially, we start out with only the liquid substance. We add more and more heat, more and more heat, and what this is doing is increasing the kinetic energy of the molecules because the temperature is increasing. Once we reach a certain point, the liquid and gas are both present in an equilibrium. This is referred to as the boiling point. You'll notice that temperature is constant even as more heat is added because this heat that's added is serving to disrupt the intermolecular forces in the liquid molecules, transitioning them into the gas phase. Along this entire temperature plateau, both liquid and gas are present and at equilibrium. After the intermolecular forces have been disrupted, any additional heat added goes into raising the temperature of the gas molecules. Again, this is a heating curve, which displays the importance of the intermolecular force disruption for the process of boiling. This, the heat required to boil a substance is referred to as the enthalpy of vaporization. We discussed enthalpy in a previous module, and remember at constant pressure, enthalpy is, real, is equal to, or the change in enthalpy is equal to the heat exchange. This table is showing enthalpy of vaporization values for four different substances, both at their boiling point and at 25 degrees Celsius. You'll notice that the change in enthalpy or the enthalpy of vaporization is always positive, and this is because it's requ required to add energy to inter or to overcome those intermolecular forces present in the liquid sample to transition them into the gas. This separation is what's required to go from the liquid condensed phase to the gaseous phase. Overall, Stronger intermolecular forces means that molecules are more attracted to each other in the liquid phase, 
which means more energy is required to separate them and go from liquid to gas. Thus, these substances with higher intermolecular forces have, or stronger intermolecular forces, have higher enthalpies of vaporization. You'll see here that water has the highest enthalpy of vaporization um, at its boiling point, which suggests that, or which demonstrates that water has the strongest intermolecular forces of the other, uh, of this set of four molecules shown here. Enthalpy of fusion is the op or is, is it representative of another phase change, which is solid to liquid transition. A similar curve is shown here with the, in the bottom right hand corner, which is the cooling curve, showing temperature as a function of heat. Initially, only the solid is present. At the melting point, solid and liquid are in equilibrium. And as more heat is added, temperature is constant because the intermolecular forces are being disrupted in the solid phase um, as the substance transitions to the liquid phase. And then after that, additional heat is added, which simply raises the temperature of the liquid. You'll note that the enthalpy of fusion, like vaporization, our values are positive. This is because it's necessary to add in energy to overcome intermolecular forces between holding molecules together in the solid phase. This is a transition from a solid to a liquid, which is going from this more ordered, more thermodynamically favored state to this less ordered, higher energy liquid state. Now let's use these enthalpies of fusion and vaporization values that are tabulated to calculate the heat required to either melt or boil a particular quantity of a substance. I'm showing the data here only for water. The first question I've asked is how much heat is required to melt two moles of ice? Now we can use a formula which depends on the amount of ice and the enthalpy of vaporization, or excuse me, the enthalpy of fusion. This is that the heat required for to boil or to free, uh, melt a particular amount of substance depends on the amount of the substance there is and its enthalpy of fusion. By using these value, the value of water, the enthalpy of fusion value, we can determine that, that to melt two moles of ice into liquid water requires 12 kilojoules of energy. We can do a very similar calculation for boiling two moles of liquid water. Again, this is important to mention that this is at its boiling point. It's not warming, it's not uh, completely indicative of the heat required to melt the, or to boil the water from a lower temperature, only at its boiling point. You'll notice that the heat required to boil two moles of water at its boiling point is much, much greater than the heat required to melt two moles of ice at its freezing point. This is also indicated by the difference in enthalpy of fusion and enthalpy of vaporization values for the four substances that were tabulated here. What this means in the case of these four substances is that a greater amount of energy is required to change the state of a substance from a liquid to a gas. For the phase change from a solid, or excuse me, from the, for the phase change from a liquid to gas to occur, it's necessary to overcome the intermolecular forces between molecules in the liquid phase, which are much stronger than those in the gaseous phase. That's why enthalpy of vaporization values tend to be greater than enthalpy of fusion values um, within a particular substance. We can put this together and look at a molecular level picture showing ice in the water in the solid phase transitioning through the melting point where the solid and liquid are in equilibrium into the liquid phase into the um the boiling uh the boiling point where liquid and gas are in equilibrium and then lastly into the phase where we have only gas. This is shown by combining the cooling and heating curves that I showed previously, 
where we have temperature on the y-axis and heat added on the x-axis. You'll notice that a lot more heat is added to go from liquid to gas than the heat added to go from solid to liquid. And this, is, um, this manifests what we saw on the previous slide in terms of the enthalpy of vaporization magnitude compared to fusion. In this video, I've discussed some examples of drawing molecular level pictures for heating and cooling processes and calculating the heat required to vaporize or melt a given amount of material. I highly recommend completing these bonus practice problems, um, which should allow you to test these skills in a little bit more detail. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.